Welcome to Olin Business School. My name is Ruthie Pyle Stifler. I'm the Associate Dean of Graduate Enrollment Management here at the Olin Business School. It is my great pleasure to welcome you this morning. Um, welcome to She Sweet in honor of International Women's Day. This is one of the many events that we put on throughout the year to meet you at the gateway of ideas, innovation, and inspiration. Before we get started today, I would love to have the opportunity to share with you some of the accomplishments that we're very proud of that we've achieved uh, throughout this year. Um, I'll start by talking to you a little bit about our full-time MBA program. As many of you may be uh, aware, we reimagined our full-time MBA experience. Uh, we took about 100 students around the world from St. Louis to Washington, DC, Washington, DC to Barcelona, Barcelona to Shanghai, before returning back here to the St. Louis area. Uh, this immersion experience and revamp to the curriculum was really designed to increase the learning agility of our students, to provide 360 feedback, and for these individuals to take business concepts and apply them in real world experiential experiences. Uh, this was an incredible opportunity, and we received tremendous recognition by being named as full-time MBA program of the year by Poets and Quants. This was truly a group effort. Um, so if you are interested in learning a little bit more about that um, opportunity and what that experience really looked like, you can see that on Poets and Quants website. Uh, they did come onto campus, do a live stream. So we do encourage you to check that out. It really truly is an incredible experience that we're very, very proud of. In addition to that, we are also very proud of the cohort that we welcome to campus. Uh, this year, we achieved near gender parity in our program, achieving 49% female representation in the class, as well as 23% underrepresented minorities. I know that all of you in the room understand the importance that underrepresented minorities as well as women play in the voices and the conversations that happen in the classroom. So we continue to look to each and every one of you to continue to send great students our way to ensure that those voices are heard and that we continue to contribute to the educational experience in a very, very positive way. So excellent, thank you, thank you. Um, in addition to that, I wanna make sure that each and every one of you understand ways that you might be able to take your own personal and professional growth to the next level. Today, we have some individuals with us that will be available after the event to talk to you a little bit about what that might look like here at the Olin Business School. Today, we have Kelly Bean, as well as Michelle Ralston, who work in our executive education programs so over there to my, to my right, your left. Uh, these individuals, Kelly Bean actually is our senior associate dean. She uh, is a true leader here at our organization. She manages both the Brookings Institute partnership as well as, as well as executive programs. So if you are interested in a one to two day program or maybe even some of our certificate programs, Michelle and Kelly will be more than happy to talk to you about that experience. In addition, registration is live for our Women's in Leadership Certificate. Um, if you're like me, who is not only surrounded by incredibly talented women, but also have had some wonderful mentors, I encourage you to continue to consider this opportunity uh, to expand your network and build upon your own personal and professional growth through this program. So registration is open. Please check it out online and talk to Kelly and Michelle. In addition, if you'd like a more formalized experience through maybe our executive MBA, our full-time MBA, our part-time MBA, or several of our specialized masters, uh, we do have Sarah Hartman as well as, well as Carrie Donnelly here, um, who can also talk to you about our more formalized traditional degree-seeking programs. Uh, they can help you understand what that may look like for you. Um, and then in addition to your personal and professional growth, we also have individuals here that can help you in other ways. So where are Allison and Christine Dearmont? We've got Allison Dietz, Christine Dearmont here from the Western Career Center. So if you or your organization are looking for tremendously talented uh, individuals to come and work in either internships or career opportunities, those individuals can certainly help you understand what that looks like for you and your organization. And last but not least, we have our two Casey's uh, from Alumni and Development right over here. Uh, those individuals can help you to understand what that might look like and other ways that you might be able to contribute. So thank you all very much to the staff for being here today and helping to support all of the individuals here in the uh, audience today to learn a little bit more about how they can work on their personal professional growth as well as help your companies grow and excel. 
All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much for that opportunity. What I would like to do at this, uh, at this phase is to introduce Stacy Thomas, and I'm going to use my notes because nobody screws up somebody's bio. Um, so <laughs> Stacy is a lecturer in communication here at Olin. She began her career as a Mandarin translator for the US Air Force, developing techniques to lower cultural barriers and increase intercultural communication effectiveness. She then took her communication expertise to the corporate world, leading communication initiatives at biotech and industrial manufacturers, including Sigma Aldrich, Emerson Electric, and Life Technologies. All told, Stacy has 15 years of experience in the corporate practice, and she loves sharing that experience with our students in ways that lend practical value to their future employment. Thank you so much, Stacy. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you all for being here. Thank you, Ruthie. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as Ruthie just mentioned, Monday is International Women's Day. And this year's theme is Each for Equal. And this, to me, spoke of individual accountability. It spoke of ownership at an individual level so that we can all have a collective vision that we've started to realize over centuries. And we're starting to get to a point where we can say, we're making headway, we're making progress. Um, and I am thrilled to have the opportunity to stand up here on the stage with these amazing women today. We have a lot to talk about and not a lot of time to get there. So I'm gonna go ahead and get some introductions underway and then we'll start with the questions. We'll keep it punchy and pithy because we wanna be able to pass it to you so that the audience can ask questions when we get to that point. So let's start with immediately to my left is Jennifer Fuller. And like Ruthie, I am going to use my notes so that I don't mess up any bios. So Jennifer grew up in Eastern Tennessee and moved to St. Louis to attend Wash U, where she graduated in 2003 as a triple threat with majors in finance, poli sci, and international business. Three days after graduation, she began working at Stiefel Nicholas Weasel, serving in various roles before the company merged and is now known as Keith Bruyette and Woods. She served there for 17 years and now has worked on over 150 completed transactions for financial institutions, public offerings, restructurings, and private placements. In addition, she's a member of her firm's Women's Initiative Executive Network Committee and has been involved in efforts the firm is making to train and mentor professional young women. Thank you for being here, Jennifer. Thank you. We also wanna welcome Cheryl Jones. Cheryl is the president and CEO of Girls Incorporated in St. Louis, a local program seeking to inspire girls to be smart, strong, and bold through educational, recreational, and cultural programs throughout the metro area. Prior to her role with Girls Incorporated, Cheryl was the president of Jones & Associates, which focused on providing individuals and organizations with strategies and solutions to affect positive change and inspire others to become transformational leaders. Cheryl received a Bachelor of Science from Howard University in Washington, DC, and participated in the Executive Development Program at Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. She was selected as an American Express Aspen Institute Fellow in 2017, and a participant at the Washington University Business Management for Nonprofit Leaders Program. Welcome, Cheryl. <laughs> and in this lovely shade of green <laughs> is Mary Mosbacher. And Mary has uh, just arrived back in from a stint in Hawaii. So I welcome back to the polar vortex. We appreciate that. <laughs> As of December, Mary officially retired her position at Edward Jones after a successful career as principal. She joined Edward Jones in 1981 as an intern in the investment banking area. But after completing her MBA at Olin in 1982, she joined the firm full time focusing on originating common stock and bond offerings. She was named a principal in 1986, that's five years. And she was the company's fifth woman partner. Upon her retirement, she was the firm's second most tenured partner and the longest tenured female partner. I suspect you'll hold that title for a while. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In 2007, the St. Louis Business Journal named Mary one of the area's 25 most influential business women, and she's one of approximately 300 women recognized by the YWCA over 30 years as a leader of distinction. She's also active in several charitable and educational organizations, including the United Way, Stages St. Louis, St. Joseph Institute for the Deaf, and the YWCA. She also serves here 
as the president of the Elliott Society at Washington University. Thank you, Mary. And all the way down on my left is Amanda Signorelli. Amanda is the founder of an early stage startup in Los Angeles called The Leafist. The Leafist is a personalized marketplace for natural remedies, helping consumers find products that match their needs by leveraging data, plant science, and biochemistry. There's a little something for everyone there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she recently launched this venture after serving roles as the CEO of Tech Week for more than three years and as a consultant for McKinsey and Company prior to that. Additionally, Amanda is the owner of a restaurant called the Golden Steer Steakhouse, which is her family's business and the oldest steakhouse in the Las Vegas area. Amanda graduated from Olin in 2013 with dual majors in international business and marketing, a minor in French and a concentration in Arabic. In 2018, she was one of four recipients of Olin's Emerging Leaders Award and was named one of the top 20 female entrepreneurs to watch in 2017 by CIO.com. So welcome, Amanda. So shall we get started? I'd like to start with a question for all of our panelists, and that is that um, as we hear people talk about gender equality in the workplace, my question is, are we there yet? What do you think? I see a yes, I see a no. <laughs> well, my question is, um, what does that look like? And how do we get there? And Cheryl, I mean, if you would like to start with us, I think that this is an issue that gets you out of bed every single morning. Every morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, no, we're not there yet. And gender equality for me is not only the fundamental right, human right for all, but it's going to also be necessary for peace, prosperity, and also um, just sustainability around the world. And so with that, I think Gender equality is only going to happen when we put systems in place that, I'm sorry, has been in place for men for over 100 some plus years. And so we're going to have to have women supporting other women and okay. systems and policies and procedures that also sustain that, that effort. So I say we're not there. We've made some tremendous uh, gains. But in order to really, really move the needle, we're going to have to keep at it. So I'm looking forward to that day where we don't have to even have the word itself as a question. Right, right. Jennifer, how about you? I would imagine that being in um, the financial services industry, you see some un unique challenges in this area. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that we are in a better place than we have been in the past in terms of gender equality, but we're obviously, we're still not there yet. I don't think most people would say that we are there yet. Um, I think what it looks like to me is equal respect uh, for women as for men in the workplace and a readiness from women and men to accept uh, women in leadership in all positions in the workplace. Um, you know, because one of the things that, that we have problems with in our industry is that women drop out at the mid-level. So you see women, most firms want mm -hmm. women to be equally represented out, out of undergrad, but then you see women drop off at the mid-level. So I think right. in terms of solutions for, for these issues, it's a tricky problem. Um, there are a lot of reasons why we have issues with women being equal in the workplace, but I think one thing that most firms have gotten more focused on in the last couple of years is unconscious bias training. Right. I think there are very, very few people, men and women, who really think that women should not be equal in the workplace. That's not that that's not the problem, right? So I think you, you know we we all have biases. Both women and men have biases. So I think. That's a, the unconscious bias training is a major piece of this. I think the Me Too movement where that has positives and negatives has been a positive thing in um, sort of compelling men to look at how they are responding to things in the workplace, that just awareness of potential bias has been helpful. I think it's representation in leadership, so not just the bottom levels, but also the mid-levels and the top levels where, where women can be in more powerful positions, where their perspectives can be more influential. Um, we need to focus on the development of women to get further in their careers to do that. Uh, what I think it isn't necessarily is equal representation of women in numbers, because one of in order to be equal, one thing that I think has to happen is that women have to have the choice 
to be in the workforce or not in the workforce. If women don't want to be in the workforce, that's that's fine. Um, mm-hmm. If men don't want to be in the workforce, I actually think that's fine. So uh, allowing women to have that choice is critical. And I think as long as there are other considerations, family planning and 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 families, that sort of thing, I think there will always be women who choose not to be in some of these positions, and that's just fine. But for people who do, I think it's very important that we have these things in place where uh, they can be uh, equally respected. I like your comment there on on the ability to choose. And I think, um, you know, if you don't mind, I'm going to bump this to Mary real quickly because um, you're a person who's who's made very calculated choices throughout throughout your career from from step one. Can you speak to a little bit about this? Well, I think it's important to clarify the definition of gender equality, because I think it's a term that's thrown around a lot Mm -hmm. that means different things to different people. Uh, Somebody who leads the communication effort, uh, that's so critical is to to define it. So if you you look at equal access, I think today uh, there is equal access for for women if women choose to to pursue a particular career. to, to what uh, we heard earlier, you know, gender parity does not exist in most businesses mm-hmm. yet. Um, and I think that's going to be a function of time. I mean, you can do the math on what it's going to take uh, to grow a, a base of women to get to 50 percent uh, uh, representation within a company that, you know, just it, it has to grow exponentially in order to, to really move the needle uh, in terms of, of overall percentages. So I think if we focus on the rate of growth in women, entering careers and, and progression, you can look and, and, and see it from a different angle and get a different perspective on that. Um, I would argue that like pay for like work is very much uh, happening today. Um, there's a lot of focus on that, in particular at the uh, entry level roles. Uh, like like we Jennifer said, that, you know, when, when you're looking to hire somebody, um, I don't think that there is a difference, the gender bias. I don't. Mm-hmm. I, I never felt it uh, individually um, back at even in 81, 82 area. But, uh, but I think it's even more pronounced because people are talking about it. It's made the headlines. It's, uh, it, it's out there. And then when you look at the, uh, the, the diversity efforts that most companies have, um, it's not even allowed anymore to, to have gender biases. So, uh, but then you get into kind of read between the lines, go, go a little deeper in some of these things and choices that, that we make as people. And you know, mm-hmm. to, to raise a family, do you drop out of the workforce? Do you slow down? I mean, that's something that a person makes a personal decision on and that's okay. And, and, and we're seeing much more of that happening now with men choosing to stay home and watch uh, kids. Uh, uh, the family decision enters in, it's not only families, it's parents. Uh, there's a lot more uh, workplace flexibility in today's world than there was. So I think we just have to be careful when we talk about equality. Um, I would argue that we are, are almost there in terms of access and pay and levelizing it. That what happens is when you start looking at it through the lens of numbers, do we have enough women wanting to pursue this uh, as a career and staying with it long term? Yeah, I wonder if that's not why we see some of what, gender, uh, what Jennifer was saying about that drop off at that mid level. Mm-hmm. Now, um, Amanda, so you've seen this from the large corporate perspective, and now now you work for yourself, but you also own another business, and so you have a few different lenses through which you can look at this at a few at varying different levels. Can you um, tell us a little bit about how you see this playing out in those circles? Yeah, I think I have uh, a bit of a different perspective. For me, I think about this very much in terms of the context of startups and venture capital. And the reality is it's not even close. We are not there. Sure, it's improving. The numbers are showing positive momentum. Between 2014 and 2018, 3% of venture dollars went to female-led exclusive teams. 8% went to mixed gender teams. If you look at where that money went and where women were dominating, it became what is still what I really hate called female-focused industries. And of course, if you look up what that definition is, you're like, oh, it's lingerie and it's shoes. You're like, what the heck? Why is that female-focused? This is absurd. Um, And so when you dive into those numbers, what is good is 20% of venture capital-backed companies in that specific space are led by women. So that's good. We're seeing specific industries where that's increasing, but overall, 3% and 8%, no, we're not anywhere near that. And it's incredibly difficult to be in this startup and even on the venture capital space, if you're thinking about the fund side, 
We used to be at a point where out of the investment partners in venture capital, only 4% were women. Now we're at 11%. That's great, but the reality is when you're looking at venture capital and startups, if you don't have female leadership from the top, both in terms of the limited partners who are deploying said capital with the funds, the funds who are making the decision to do the direct investment in the companies, and then the companies themselves, if you don't have that diversity, you're going to continue to see these numbers where it's really sad the amount of money that's actually being directed into these female-led companies. And for me, when I think forward-looking, where do we need to go? There's certainly some problems today when we think about the broader pipeline, when it comes Mm -hmm. to technologically savvy women who are encouraged to study computer science, stay with computer science. That means your teacher should also be a woman. You shouldn't necessarily be in a room where all of your teachers are guys. But thinking about that in a broader perspective and then a bit on the retention side, especially when you think about fundraising, the most challenging conversation you're going to have is an investor who turns around and says, are you planning on having children? Mm -hmm. When? (laughs) What are you going to do? How's that going to work? And I'm actually not opposed to them asking me that question at all. What I am opposed to, though, is that they're not going to ask the guy next to me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, having a family is hard on Mm -hmm. everyone. So don't just ask me that. I should be able to give you an answer because I should be fundraising with a plan for how I'm going to be able to do maternity leave for myself and for my employees. But ask everyone. So that's a huge problem for me. And I think the other piece as well is access to capital isn't there yet. It is really hard to raise as a woman. There's a lot of biases Mm -hmm. that go into that. We are not improving. And I would also like to see us putting our money where our mouth is. So we have a room here of very successful women who are phenomenal. You could be investing. It's Mm -hmm. not something that immediately comes to your mind. But because of that, you're not necessarily putting your capital work to bring other women along. So think about it. How can you help people have access to capital? That's a fantastic segue, but I want to kind of take all of this and put it together. So, you know, we had some comments about, you know, the choices that we as women get to make regarding our career. We had some discussion about, you know, gender parity. And one of my questions when it comes to gender parity is what does the applicant pool look like? Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, but are those choices then that women, that young women are making that maybe prohibit them from doing these things? And so, um, but that leads me into my next question is when we talk about, um, you know, women in the workforce, we know, we know that young women need men mentors. Um, And getting those mentors is not always easy. And a lot of times women don't know how to do that, especially when they're young. And so um, can we talk a little bit about the advice that you might give a young woman entering the workforce who's looking to negotiate that balance between, say, um, you know, building relationships as part of, you know, finding mentors and creating a professional network um, versus that, that flip side of being perceived as too nice or alternatively too assertive. And, you know, and there's a risk of losing respect in that. And so, um, Amanda, I'm going to actually, I'm going to leave it with you for a second because I know that this question really resonates with your early experiences. Um, so if you don't mind speaking to how do we grow young women in the workplace? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm actually going to split that into two pieces. The first, which is a broader kind of concept around mentors and networking. The second is this bright line that we're always walking of uh, the fine line of female assertiveness is right. kind of always the tagline you hear people refer to it. When you think about networking and mentors, I think that's a really interesting place to begin with, with women in particular, because in 2018, there, there was a great study that was released by the Human Relations Journal that showed women tend to look for mentors who they can be friends with. They're going to be supportive. They're going to be emotionally there and available to have conversations. Men look for people that they can be ally, uh, pretty much kind of bonded with or have some sort of relationship. And the term that they use, the term they use for this is alliances. What kind of alliance can I create? It's not necessarily about being friends. It's about being able to work with somebody. And the difference is alliances open up a broad spectrum of people you can be working with and a plethora of opportunities. It also means that you have more of these relationships and they become more informal, which just gives you more opportunities yourself. And when you think about the next iteration, it comes down to sponsors. And sponsors are the people who turn around and say, hey, you're in this room with all of these people. You need to go meet this person. And they walk you over. They give you a really nice and generous introduction. They kick off the conversation and they make that meaningful introduction. That's what gets you promoted. That's what gets you the next opportunity is people actively doing that and opening that network. And so when I think about mentors and sponsors, it's important and I think imperative for us to shift it a little bit of how do you expand that base? Now, when you're doing that, there's that balance of how do I begin that conversation? I'm trying to prove that I can be worthy of this in the first place. Are they even going to want to? And you try to overprove yourself, which leads you to all of a sudden being awkwardly assertive, which is uncomfortable for everyone. And so you're just constantly in this very fluid balance. 
And I think what's interesting for me is we can all agree that there's some baseline quick wins of you don't have to say sorry all the time. You don't need to be sitting with a smile the entire time. Things that are pretty easy to get to the next stage. And then on the assertiveness piece, there's this balance of never really forcing your opinion, being willing to disagree, but then also realizing the most powerful thing is to get other people to have that consensus and share that perspective. So how do you balance those things? And that's a little bit of the how. But I think what makes the how even more important in terms of balancing that nice versus too assertive is actually more important of when you choose to say something. So do you choose to have a perspective at the table if you have something valuable to say? Or do you sit in the back and take notes? Do you choose to disagree with somebody or do you not simply because you don't like the idea of conflict and being uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. Do you choose to say something when a hard decision has to be made that people won't like and maybe you'll be wrong? And do you choose to say something when maybe you messed up? And those instances of when I think are equally as important to the how. So it's a fluid dynamic, but I think the combination of all of those elements is really critical to think about. Okay, thank you. And I think, you know, again, we're coming back to those individual choices, which again is is our theme for International Women's Day is how do we as individuals make that change for the collective whole? Um, Jennifer, I would argue you're kind of the consummate relationship builder, but um, how do you do this with young women when they join your workforce? What are you seeing and how do you help them grow? Yeah, you know, I think, I wish that when I started uh, my career, I knew that relationship building wasn't just a thing that you should be doing. It's the thing you should be doing. (laughs) Because you you can't have enough relationships. It doesn't matter. You don't have to choose, even at the outset, whether someone's going to be helpful to your career. You find out that the people who you know early on in your career, they get older and they get in positions that that matter. Um, And it's kind of hard when you start your job because it's you come in and like everybody kind of feels like your dad, you know what I mean, or your mom, but mostly your dad, right? So you're not really sure what you have to bring to these relationships. Um, and I, I see women coming in and, and being a little bit, they're not sure what they're supposed to be. So um, everybody's a little stiff, I was. And so right. I think what you're supposed to be, what you're supposed to be is, is yourself within the appropriate context of the professional environment that you're in. Um, it's, it's, it has, it's enough. It has to be enough because you can't, you can't be anybody else. Right. So I think as people progress in your careers, you feel a little bit more comfortable with that because you learn what that is in your specific professional environment, what it is to be yourself, what your own personal style is. So I think it's important to to know that, but you know, and I don't think you can be too nice in in that, in that context. Right. So you don't have to come to the table and, and be, assertive and, and aggressive in all situations, I think you, you always need to do it sometimes. Particularly, you can get into situations if you it, for people who are very nice, where they may be taken advantage of or people feel like they can go too far with them. And I think the test really is, I've always, lo- you know, what I've found helpful is to look at myself like uh, I'm not myself and to say, you know, is she being treated fairly? Is that something that, that if someone was, a seasoned professional, she would actually say something about. It's it's easier when you depersonalize because you think, well, maybe I shouldn't say something. But actually, if if you can look at it objectively as if you're not yourself and say, well, that's not fair for her. You should be treating yourself with the same respect that you believe everybody else, with which you believe everybody else should be treated. And if you speak up in those circumstances, you will be sometimes viewed as too assertive or too aggressive, and that's fine. Um, you know, that, that is a bias against women sometimes in the workplace. And, and I think don't worry too much about it because um, you know, they're, they're not worrying too much about you if you don't get what you're supposed to have. So um, right. that's the way I think about it. Um, I think that's a really great comment on, um, you know, not, you can't really worry about whether you're being perceived as too assertive because a measure of that is necessary to get what you need in the workplace. Um, but I think it is, it's not natural for so many young women. And you mentioned that they don't even necessarily know who they are. Um, and that's, you know, I think part and parcel maybe of just being young and it doesn't matter what gender that is. I think it's just part of being young. But one of the key takeaways here is that's What's natural or easy for a person is not necessarily what is going to lend the most value to to your career path. Um, And so if we can take a second, I want to talk about the natural strengths that you had that contributed to your success. Um, And then let's contrast that to those things that you had to to hone. 
uh, over time. And so um, I want to kind of, let's just top line those natural strengths because I really want to dig into what did you have to hone and how did you do it? Cheryl, I know you have great stories in this area. Can you talk a little bit about what came easily and what did not? So thank you. Um, what came easy always was I was a leader from uh, a young girl. I always wanted to lead something. And even when I would back off, it would also be the place that I found my strength. So people would naturally say, hey, why don't you lead this? So that's a natural one for me. I'm an organizer. I like to organize things, people, because I think I'm pretty good at that. And one of the strange ways or one of the strange things is I never heard no. And I was like, what is that? My no always turned to on. Mm -hmm. So I just turned the words around. I was like, on, this means no, 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 it's never no. <laughs> and so in some kind of strange way, that was another skill that was easy for me is taking that no and just turn it into that was just one time because I was a natural salesperson. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to keep going to it. Not always did I get it, but I didn't have any problems of continuing to ask. I like that because from a, you know, just from a simple language perspective, when you tell a child they can lead, and give them the opportunity to lead. You give them the opportunity to become a leader. Absolutely. That lends some nice uh, lends nicely to the mentorship issue. Um, Jennifer, it all seems easy for you. <laughs> 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 is that is that real? Is that a thing? No, no, that's not, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. Um, it's supposed to be hard, isn't it? Yeah, it is hard. I think, I think we have to, to recognize hard. it's hard. Yeah, right? and we have to recognize it's hard. I mean, I think the the early on in my career, I was always told that hey, you're really thoughtful, you're very analytical, um, you can figure things out. Um, the harder things were some of the things that I just talked about, the relationship building part. Um, the way I look at sort of getting better or finding my strengths is, so you have the bucket that you're good at, the you know analytical stuff, the thoughtfulness. You can you can always come back to that when you're when you're struggling and find those strengths and pull from those strengths. There's the stuff that I'm really bad at. So like um, I hate golf. <laughs> tried to, I tried to learn how to play golf. I'm terrible. That actually counts though, right? Really, it really does. terrible at it. And it's good for the people who. <laughs> Um, might have to play golf with me because I'd be bad company for four hours or uh, is that how long it takes to play golf? I don't know. Um, yes. and, and then there's every, and then there's sort of everything in the middle. So, um, delegation and, and management and relationship building, those are things that I can do, but it's not low hanging fruit. And so that's the stuff that I have had to constantly work at. And I think when you're in an environment and if you're not in a structured environment where you get good feedback, I think you can create that by, by finding people who are going to give you honest feedback. Um, sometimes that's hard. Sometimes you, uh, who's the woman that has the sort of the um, radical candor book? Do you know what I'm talking oh, about? Yeah. So it's, it's finding the people who are going to give you real feedback, both in a nice way and in a um, not so nice way, as opposed to people who are going to tell you that you're, you're doing a really nice job um, and, and constantly working on that. I had a client who uh, was one of the uh, most talented women I think I, I've worked with on the client side, who it was, a, was a trained executive coach. She trained her leadership team or paid for her leadership team to have executive coaches. And I don't know, there are probably people in the room who've worked with them, but that's an expensive endeavor. And the way she talked about it to me, because I spoke with her about it, was, you know, you know, Jen, I don't know how you look at your career, but I look at my career as if you're dedicated to it, I look at it as I'm an, I'm an athlete. And you need somebody who's constantly going to uh, challenge you and tell you what you need to, to work on. And I think, you know, and what that process does is it forces you to confront the things that you don't like about yourself. And first of all, become okay with mm -hmm. them, but also think about ways, getting comfortable with that and thinking about ways that you can compensate for some of your weaknesses. And if you make a commitment to doing that over a long period of time, you get you get better and better and, and better than the people who don't make a commitment because you're always building on what you've already done. Stacy, I am executive coach, so I'm talking to myself all the time <laughs> how uh, to slow down because my strengths sometimes overplay my areas of growth. So I'm sometimes so way out in, in front of people that I'm like, okay, I know they heard me, didn't they? 
You got to back I'm up. Looking back, I'm like, uh, I think they're with me somewhere. Um, so I know in my heart of hearts that I need to slow down and listen more. And that's something that I'm continuing to try to do a little bit better. And the other piece around that is honing the skills of relationships. So I would um, have this notion that all I needed to do was work hard because that's what my parents told me. Put your head down, work hard. Working hard is the relationships mm -hmm. more than your job skills and understanding the work that's ahead. If you're not um, spending time with people, you've lost the battle. You've got right. to build those that time into connecting with people. So I have like a, it used to be called a Rolodex, but a time, <laughs> a Rolodex or something, a check off <laughs> list that I then go back to and say, I haven't talked to this person in, you know, certain time, certain months or whatever. And I need to re-engage so that I'm never out of that person's mindset or connection or network. So I think that's one that I learned over time. We so often hear exactly what you said, and that is, you know, and I, I don't know if it's just women, but I know that I've heard it quite often, and that is do the work and you'll get recognized. Let your work speak for itself. And so, you know, I very much appreciate that you said the work is not, it's not, it's not the typing, it's not the numbers, it's it's the people. Yes. It's the people. Um, one thing that I think um, it's a feature that I think women possess in, in great depth is intuition. And an emotive view of challenges, a very, a very uh, broad way of looking at challenges. Um, at Olin, we educate students to um, to make data-driven decisions, informed by numbers, but driven by principle. Excuse me. So, as a leader, how do you balance that data? in front of you with your own values or those of the organization. Um, Mary, if you don't mind speaking to this real quickly, this is something you do daily and have for you. <laughs> or I used to do daily. Let's put <laughs> it that way. I'm do. retired now, so it's, it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> Maybe you didn't do it in Hawaii. You know, no, <laughs> um, but I did fly to a board meeting and back, so it's, you know, <laughs> things happen. Um, but, uh, you know, I think when we, we discussed decision making. Uh, early on in my career, I had a, a leader tell me that leadership was not a popularity contest. Mm -hmm. And that really resonated with me uh, because it permissioned me to make the tough decision, basically, and realize that you are never going to please everyone mm -hmm. and you will always have naysayers. Yes. So once you accept that as a base, it creates a level of objectivity that enables you to weigh both sides to things. Um, and there are always two sides. Sometimes it's multiple More. sides, but mm -hmm. as long as you recognize that there's a couple of sides to everything, you have to, to go through it and say, okay, how can this play out? How can that play out? So the scenario planning, and maybe that's where the intuition comes in. But um, the other part to it that I, I guess I was really rewarded so often um, uh, at, at Edward Jones because of our corporate structure and, and being a partnership um, that I didn't have a lot of conflicts of interest uh, that impacted my decisions. And I think a lot of people are put in places where they know what the right decision is, but there's a gain or loss to them personally that is associated mm -hmm. with that decision or could be perceived. And that's a conflict of interest. Right. And so I tried to distance myself from the potential for conflicts of interest, whether it was a win or a loss, uh, it skews your objectivity. So you have to be able to get beyond that and say, this is the right thing to do. Right. This is the, where the values come in. And I think most of us know that. Uh, but those are the tough decisions to make uh, when you realize that um, there are things at stake that are going to play out and you've got to be able to weather the storm that will come after the decision. So I always talk about you have to own your decision. You can't waver once you've made it, you've got to put the stake in the ground and you've got to be able to take the bullets when they come your way um, and how does that, that play out. Um, I'm gonna come back to the theme of communication. When, when we talked uh, earlier, um, as I reflect back on my career, uh, communication is so critical in everything we do. And if I had to go back and do a root cause analysis for problem solving or decision making, the lack of appropriate communication right. 
uh, is usually one of the many items on the table, but it's always there. And so when you think about decision making, I don't lose sight of the importance of communicating. And it's not just communicating down to the people who are impacted. You better make sure you're communicating up so that you've got your leadership support as well. Uh, because when you have to be able to dig in your heels and make a tough decision, especially those that impact your organization broadly, um, you've got to have the support of your senior leaders as well. So I would start going up, make sure here's where I'm, you know, explain what, what is uh, at stake and, and why you've made the decision. If you need to ask for support, ask for it because you're going to need their support and then be able to communicate, but stick with it and own your decisions. I like that this perspective of, you know, how do I, how do I view this from the measure of various stakeholders? What if you're an entrepreneur? Amanda, if you don't mind, I want to spin this over to you because everything is not necessarily a conflict of interest, but everything is a major point of interest. The decisions you make have high personal impact. If you make the wrong decision, you could be out of business right? in a very quick second, <laughs> uh, which is just a very stressful situation to be working from. And I think f credit to Olin and same thing that we saw you know, at McKinsey, they do a very good job of you constantly want to have as much research available. You want to do all of your homework. You want to have the data. You want to do the analysis. You want to be thorough. Um, and I think McKinsey also did a very good job of continually emphasizing to go analysis first. And it was this almost kind of gut became a dirty term. Like, don't use your gut. There's pattern recognition, which mm -hmm. is for partners, but that's not you at this point, right? And so it's an interesting balance. And then when you become an entrepreneur and all of a sudden you're the only one there and you're the only one with the information and the authority and the ability to make those decisions, you're also the only one who has the perspective of everything that is going around. Whether that is a conversation you're having with a board, if that's a conversation you're having with an investor, your employees, you are the only one who sits at the nexus of all of that information and all of the data that's in front of you. Sometimes you'll have companies, and I had one context in which we had a plethora of data. It was all terrible data, and it wasn't actually usable. <laughs> so then it was, okay, if we use this, we're making bad decisions. And then another context in which there was no data. And when you think about the rapid pace of startups, you're making hundreds, if not thousands, of decisions every single week. Are you trying this ad copy? Are you going to go ahead and interview this person? Are you going to take that meeting? That meeting means that you're not going to spend time here. You're constantly going through there. And at some point, you have to be comfortable with your gut. And that was probably the hardest thing for me personally, because I hate that. I like the analysis. I love the data. That makes me feel much better. Uh, and at some point, I had to deal with this decision overload, especially when I first became CEO at Tech Week, And I had no idea what to do with the amount of decisions I had to make. It felt like it came out of nowhere. I'm like, what am I doing in this role? This was a terrible decision. You were 25 when you were made CEO? Very young. Yeah. Had no <laughs> idea what I was getting myself into whatsoever. Uh, and quickly, in the first three months, it was this sink or swim. And right. I got to the point of being able to develop my own innate system of urgency, high impact, urgency, low impact. Is it not urgent? And creating that triage system and then being willing to write things mm -hmm. at the very bottom of my paper, which is where I started on my to-do list of okay, I'm actually going to force myself to do this and get into the habit of what kind of decision is this? Is this something that I can go do the homework and the analysis for? Or is it something I can rely on my gut? And that balance became really important, but it wasn't something I naturally had. It was something I had to build. Thank you. Well, while we're on the subject of Olin and data-driven, um, I want to ask Jennifer, I want to ask you specifically a question that I think fits squarely in your wheelhouse. Um, as Ruthie was mentioning, um, Olin's first year MBA enrollment was 49% women for 2019. And so that is the closest uh, top school for gender parity according to Forte Foundation. Mm -hmm. What if we envision that in the C-suite? What does gender parity in the C-suite look like? How does that impact the business world if we can achieve that? Oh, I think that would be tremendously impactful. You yeah. know, as yeah. part of my job, I work with lots of different types of companies and I walk into environments and teams where they all operate differently. And you can feel, you know, the studies say um, that diversity within an organization, particularly within leadership, actually improves the mm -hmm. outcomes of the organization because right. it makes people a little bit uncomfortable. And then they start having to listen to ideas that they don't want to hear. And then over time, you make you, it may take more de deliberation, but the firm makes better decisions. So you can sort of see and, and feel when you walk into these organizations, if they value diversity, and this is just a personal anecdote, I don't, you know, the, not, the, not the studies, but this thing. This is a golf you know, anecdote. This is a, <laughs> this 
this is this is a, this is this is a, you can kind of feel it you know right. when you walk into an organization if there if there are lots of different types of people around and they are valued it feels more energetic it feels more like people are listening to one another as opposed to going in and you have um, and you have a bunch of white men or you have people who um, have sort of family owned organizations and they've kept their family and friends around them but not had other people in the leadership mm. suite so it's a it, it feels different. So it, it, that's important. I think, you know, as we've gotten, uh, our, our firm now has women on uh, the board, local, locally headquartered, women on the board, right? And, and women in, in leadership levels. And that has impacted the organization because you do have those perspectives uh, and people who better, in, in our Women's Initiative Network, people who better understand the challenges and can help develop women. So I think that is critically uh, important to have that diversity and investors are starting to recognize that, to require that the, the organizations or the companies that they invest in have uh, women on boards. You've seen uh, you know, a Jamie Dimon surgery as, as and brought, if you've read, read the news articles, they all mention the, the women who are potential candidates to secede, to, to secede him that have been brought up into larger leadership within the organization. And that's, that's not unique among uh, the, the large banks either. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's really important. The thing that I think we have to be careful not to assume yet is that parity in uh, educational programs and parity for women coming into the workforce right. means that we're getting to uh, parity at the C-suite level, which is right. I don't think is what you were suggesting at all. Not at all. But um, we have to we have know. we have to have programs and and um, mentorship in place so that women can continue to progress through their organizations. An organization should want diversity and, and talent that is diverse within their organizations. Well, and I think it's a tough balance because, you know, if we want, it seems like if we want parity in the C-suite, we have to bring more women into the workforce at, at every level and keep them there. And that then becomes a measure and maybe a conflict with some of the choices that women have to make. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, to play on real quick, and if you don't mind, Amanda, I want to kind of just bounce this to you really quickly, because what she was saying, um, does that counter what you were telling us about investors and the, the funding that women-backed ventures actually get? Yeah, so you recently saw Goldman come out very recently saying we're not going to back IPOs that have exclusively all white male boards. That was huge. That was very recent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we still have quite a bit to go to okay. but see how this translates from public market to private market to startups. And so I'm really thrilled to see that investors are starting to talk about, yes, we want to see diversity. Yes, we want to be pushing out more female entrepreneurs and we think this is great. Um, you're also seeing investors saying, oh, you know, I did my female investment for the year. Oh, no. Right. So you want to do it, but you're not going to keep doing it. That's a problem. So I've had meetings where we've talked to other entrepreneurs who have been told, like, you're going to be the token for this portfolio. And that's a really tough conversation to have. Right. Because viscerally, you're sitting there like, are you are we really at the day and the age where this is the conversation? Um, and it, it's still a big part of it. So I think. What's exciting is we're starting to have this conversation at the levels that matter that will trickle down. Everything is improving. The momentum is going in the right direction. We are getting there. I am happy to hear that. I think there is this balance and maybe this is a little bit controversial, but it's, it's a really tough one of you also don't want to see women exclusively being put into board roles because mm -hmm. they're going to check off that box that right. you need for California or for Goldman. That's not the way to get this done. The way to get this done is to have women, keep women, inspire fun women, and build them all the way up. So I'm thrilled that we're having this movement, and I'd like to just keep the momentum going. Thank you. Um, I want to kind of bring this into present day, but if you don't mind, real quickly, and I'm just going to, if you could pop off an answer. Are you ever not working? <laughs> no. I no. Usually, usually not. Yeah, <laughs> usually not. <laughs> No. no, always Mary? working. <laughs> Back from Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's an interesting question because uh, I, I think work is part of who we are. Yeah, right. You know, we are, it, and it's hard to say, you know, can we flip a switch and turn from, you yeah. know, from, you know, go from mom and wife to yeah. leader. And I, 
it's kind of who we are. It's right. in our, and so uh, I, I would say no, we're always okay. on. Amanda? I'd say no, I also agree. It's just a matter of integration. Mm -hmm. I think there that's actually a really interesting mm -hmm. concept that I didn't fully appreciate when I first started getting out in the workforce of bringing and overlapping all of your communities together. And mm -hmm. I share this one quick tidbit of, I was in LA for an investment conference. And while I was out there, I met another WashU alumni who came up and said, it's really good to see you, we should catch up, but there's actually a angel investment happy hour that's happening across the street. Why don't you come with me? And now we were taking this, yeah. here's my friend, into my professional life mm -hmm. of bringing me along. And now we have a good community of there's 10 of us in the LA community that are all looking for funding and investors on that side. And when there's an event, we catch up personally and we bring each other there. So we're integrating our lives together and starting to be supporters at all points. Well, and you mm -hmm. said there, you were talking about the work-life integration, yeah. right? And these panels always, I mean, always ask about work-life balance. And I think, you know, the general rule is that it's really more about integration. Um, but what I do wonder about is you slash other balance. So uh, what I want to know is what do you do to tend to yourself? How do you keep yourself emotionally, spiritually, mentally grounded when you are always on. Um, Mary, do you want to talk about that for a moment? Well, I, we always talked in analogies to Jones. And so I, uh, I, I adopted the uh, mantra that life was a jigsaw puzzle. And you just had to figure out how the pieces fit together as long as you didn't constrain yourself by time. Right. So that, that's, that's the biggest issue we have is the time factor. And so you have to prioritize. You have to figure out where, what, uh, what is important to you and then make, make a point to get it done. Um, and then the question is when, right? And so what I found personally is, um, and, and I'm, I, this isn't a daily routine or anything, but, but my calendar became my roadmap to life. Mm -hmm. I lived in my phone, still do. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, people would laugh when I said, well, I have my hair appointment scheduled 12 months out. <laughs> I, I do. I still, I mean, even today, I mean, I'm booked really through, I'm through December. <laughs> my, uh, my stylist knows, okay, we got to work with her schedule. How does it work? But once it's in the calendar, it's in the calendar, right? Um, we got it. We, we, we prioritize. I got to have the haircut. Um, but, but we did it in our personal life, right? And, and so uh, people look and, you know, both my husband and I, we were very active in the St. Louis community. Well, how did that happen? Well, we put it in the calendar. Yeah, do you send your husband meeting <laughs> okay. requests? I send my husband We have meeting season requests. tickets to everything. Why? Because you get the days in advance and you put it in the calendar. <laughs> it's true. And, and so once it's there, it's there. Uh, what you trade off is spontaneity, mm. right? And, and so we always laugh, there's no spontaneity in our life. So, uh, I don't even know and what that's that is what we're anymore. having to adjust to a little bit in retirement now. <laughs> Uh, but I, but I think it's it's important to to really uh, be able to make those choices of what's important and determine what's important. And uh, so, there, is there a balance? You choose that, right? That that's another one of those choices. Mm -hmm. And you've got to figure out how do you make it all work. And the answer is it can and it will mm -hmm. if you want it to. Uh, but you've got to be able to have confidence to say, I can't do this. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. One of, the, uh, one of our managing partners recently passed away, uh, but somebody who was very influential in, in my early career. And I sat down with him in 1988 and just asked him, I was eight months pregnant, said, how is this baby going to affect my career? I was the first partner to have a baby. And he, he just looked at me and said, you know, no one's ever asked me that. I said, well, it's time to talk. Uh, you know, we, we've got to, be, right, my communication piece again, right? You've got to be able to have these conversations and the confidence to, to have the conversation. And he basically said, you know, you're going to have conflicts to determine. You're going to have to make a choice at some point between a business meeting and a piano recital or a teacher's meeting. And he said, if I were you, I'd choose the piano recital or teacher's meeting because there's only going to be one of those. There'll be plenty of meetings. And that permissioned me in my mind to say, hey, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then as a leader, I continued to reflect that, kind of trickle down to, to the others that, that uh, worked with me. And I think it enabled us to have a very family-friendly environment. It was probably the early s stages of flex work time and uh, work from home. Uh, the firm put a, a an office in my home. And you know we didn't have cell phones then. So to be able to work remotely 
Uh, it they didn't do. happen, right? But you, you kind of paved the way, mm-hmm. but you have that conversation. And um, I mean, I think that's really the way you do it is you have to make your choices and, and uh, figure out what's important. And then those things that can go by the wayside or you choose to have somebody else do it for you, like clean my house, cut my grass. <laughs> I need more of those people. I'm just saying, there's choices. <laughs> Amanda, how about you? Because yours is, you're, you are fully driven by, you work for you, right? So you have a lot of factors pulling you in a lot of different directions. How do you tend to yourself? I really like uh, the phrase that you had just used around permissioned. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really important thing is what's the trigger that allows you to finally mm-hmm. say, I'm going to fight for myself first and put myself first because no one else will. Yeah. And that mm-hmm. balance is so hard when you have all of these things going on and moving. And for me, I was absolutely the young person that went into McKinsey. was like, I will do everything. I will die for you, whatever you want. <laughs> um, and I took it way too seriously. I really did. And so I distinctly remember pulling three all-nighters in London, showing up at a client mm-hmm. meeting, did a great job in that client offsite, and then fainting in mm. that client office. And it was just because I was so, not so determined. So determined. I'm like, I, I want to be able to be great, and I want to be able to make it to the next level. And it had a huge impact on my health. And it really forced me to all of a sudden think about, wow, how did I get here? Am I willing to say no? Am I willing to give myself that space? And having that conversation with, mentors and board members later on who eventually got to the point of saying, okay, what's your non-negotiables? What do you need to keep going at this pace? And for me, I really love to sleep. I like that. I need at least seven hours. That's just me. And then the other piece is quality time. And that has been new for me because I'm newly married, which is wonderful. Congratulations. But now I have this other person I have to like factor into my life. (laughs) I'm like, oh, I have to bring you everywhere. (laughs) What the heck? So that's become this new challenge, but it's also great in front of mind for me of as I'm balancing multiple businesses and multiple stakeholders, how do I prioritize the quality time with the key relationships? This new person who has to be with me, which Mm -hmm. is great. And then my aging parents, which is Mm -hmm. a new dynamic I thought I wouldn't have to deal with candidly for another 15 years and is now an active part of my daily consideration. And right. that changes the way you view things. It really does. It does. Yeah. And you know, and I think um, when we talk about, I'm going to transition us because we only have a few more minutes and I, there are a couple things I want to hit on. And one of those is, you know, as all of us move forward with our careers, with our lives, one of the things that, um, that becomes a little more prominent is legacy. Right. And how do we how do we want to leave a legacy and know that in some way we've left the world a little bit better than we found it? Um, Mary, I know legacy is so important to you just because you are so active in the community and so active at Washington University. We're very grateful to be recipients of that. Um, But if you had to define in your own words how you're changing the world for good, how would you define it? Well, I think there's three dimensions. First is the corporate side. Um, And I was able to you know, to really reflect back on my career and say, I made an impact not only for our clients at Edward Jones, but on the insurance industry as a whole, because I led our insurance area for some 24 years and created new products and innovation and really um, advanced through innovation, uh, the insurance industry by not being insurance expert, uh, really challenging them to think differently and blending uh, some of the principles from the securities industry into the insurance industry. And I absolutely can say with certainty that we've left the world a better place because I impacted so many clients' lives. Um, well over a million of our clients have these products now. So it's just been remarkable from a, you know, very satisfying. But then I also look at it from the personal side of things, right? And, um, you know, I think the role model piece uh, you know, mm-hmm. to the extent I inspired other women to come and stay at Jones. Uh, I always felt that I was an ambassador for the company and I could attract people uh, to come to work for Jones. And then uh, in many ways, I would have been a living legend that would say, well, if Mary can do it, I can do it too, right? You know, somebody who stayed with it. Um, at the time, I wasn't doing anything deliberate. It was just who I was. But I think when you get to this stage of a career and you can look backwards, you can say, yeah, I really did impact a lot of people's lives as a role model. And then uh, the, you know, from our children's, our two sons uh, and our involvement in the community, uh, that role model played out there too, that we weren't just focused on career, 
but we were very focused on the St. Louis community and what we could do to give back because we feel very grateful uh, for the blessings that have been bestowed on us from a career perspective to have financial resources to give back, uh, to have the time to give back. And so you had to make time to do that as well. And that became important to us from a scheduling perspective. Right. <laughs> How do we calendar. make all of it fit? But again, if it, we're doers. Right, and one of, you know, we're talking about innate talents. I'm a drives for results person. And it's like, well, we can do this. You know, let's, how, how can we make it happen? And so I do think that I've inspired others to follow uh, in our footsteps by leading through charitable endeavors and giving back to the community as well. Thank you. And Cheryl, your story, your story is one that just kind of warms my heart. Um, and you have stated that you're a product of the women who surround you, or sure. who have surrounded you, who have brought you up, um, and now you pay that forward. So can you talk to us a little bit about the legacy as you see it? Yeah, so uh, thank you. Mom, my aunt, uh, grandmother, all of them were just strong role models and teachers uh, that just said to me, sure, I'll go out and do and be, and let the sky be the limit. And so based on that, I am now in, I call my legacy a chapter book, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I was an engineer, I was a salesperson, I was a leader, executive coach, and now I'm in this chapter, I say chapter 23, and I won't tell you the other chapters that are to come. <laughs> <laughs> but chapter 23 is being president of this amazing organization called Girls Incorporated. And with that, inspiring all girls to be strong, smart, and bold, I'm always reminded as I go into the office or interfacing with girls on a daily basis, how the impact was for me. And so to have young women, sometimes five years old, sometimes 10, 15, 20 years old, say to me, you know what, you are my role model. I'm like, okay, that's cute and nice. <laughs> <laughs> but to really hear, because when I came to Girls Inc. six years ago, I said, if I could just change one life. Right. Mm -hmm. And now we have 54 kids in college. And so I'm like, okay. <laughs> Big deal. And um, Cheryl, you also, you have a new initiative underway too, oh, right? Yeah. Can I ask you about that real quick? Okay, so <laughs> thank you, Stacy. Because one of the things that we have to be reminded of is if we can change one person's life, and I think it starts with young kids. So mm -hmm. our initiative is 500 women for $500. Now, some people will say, mm, that's a lot. No, 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 break it down in increments. Mm -hmm. If you choose not to go to buy those nice pair of shoes or a dinner or something like that, um, you could give $500 and that'll change a girl's life. And you can also not only just give the 500, but become one of those mentors for that young woman. And if you remember when that one person that became your mentor, your coach, how that made an impact for you, that would be something that you could do for a young girl that may not have the advantages that you might have sitting in the audience, but you'll pay it forward. And I'm always thinking about my leader's legacy. I hope one little girl will say, she did something good. So that's it. That's what I would hope. Individual so choices you. for collective growth. Collective 500 <laughs> women. I think there's 600 people in here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this could be easy, Stacy. <laughs> so um, I guess I would say it was probably maybe in the early 1990s, we had this thing called speed dating. Do you guys remember that? Mm -hmm. You had to do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because we are running tight on time, but I want to hit you guys with one last question. So we're going to keep it fun and speedy. Can you tell us, 30 seconds, what's the best career advice you ignored or the worst career advice you took? And what was that hard lesson learned? Jennifer. Yeah. So <laughs> I've made a number of decisions in my career and in life that I think are a little bit different than people in my life probably would have wanted me to make different decisions. I've um, turned down a job offer that would have offered me significantly more money than I was making mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, I moved to New York much later in my career. Uh, I have not had children. Those are all decisions that I think were, you know, unpopular among the people mm -hmm. that, that don't matter. 
<laughs> right? Because they're not me. Um, and, <laughs> and so I think it's really helpful um, to solicit advice from people. Um, but, but you know, you, you go through all this, and I'm sorry if I went over 30 seconds. So you go through all of this, um, you know, you're in school so you can get to the next thing. You're in your first job so you can get to the next thing. And at some point, you are living the thing. Like, right. you're, you're living the thing that you're supposed to be living. And you can't keep doing things to get to the next thing. You have to live for yourself. And so I think intuition is powerful. When you have, you can do a pro-con column and that column can say, this is the decision I want to make, but this one kind of feels like the right one. And I think you have to ask yourself, why does this one feel like the right one? If, it, if it's fear of failing, if it's fear of inadequacy, if it's laziness, if it's anger, you can't make that decision because your ego is in the way. But if it feels like the right decision, even though it doesn't look right on paper, that's the one you should take. I think everybody's got sort of a path in life that you're not supposed to force. You're supposed to let it unfold, even though you're supposed to constantly work and, and make an effort at, at being your best. But I, I think you have to do the thing that, that feels right. And so there will be unpopular decisions, but you have to, you have to follow your gut Thank when you. it comes from the right place. Right? Thank you. Cheryl. So I think for me, it was uh, not following the rules. Someone told me a long time ago, whatever rules there are, yeah, look at them, but break through the rules, break through um, the possibilities. Don't, let, don't limit yourself to it's just this or that. If you really want it, go out and find out how you can get it. And so I think that was probably my best career advice uh, that was given to me. And the worst was to put your head down and they'll notice you. Mm -hmm. They will not notice you if you don't come out of that cubicle, walk mm -hmm. around <laughs> and meet individual people and make it a priority, even more so than your job. I think that was my worst career advice is don't worry about it. They'll know you. It's mm -hmm. who knows you. That's the biggest piece that we have to keep in mind. You've got to make connectors in order to advance in this world is my belief. Thanks, Cheryl. Mary. I had to go back in time uh, to really find one that, that I thought had enough meat on it to share. But um, early in my, my second career at Jones, which uh, was when I took over our insurance area, um, I was uh, scheduled to go to a training meeting on the insurance product. I, I was put into this leader role without having an insurance license. And so I had to really learn the product line that I was leading. And our managing partner had put on uh, put a, uh, the insurance topic on a, a, a very advanced meeting with an outside board. And I chose not to go to that meeting to represent the product as the leader because I really didn't feel comfortable as a subject matter expert at the time and sent somebody else who was the subject matter expert. Um, the consequences from that, there was fallout, not from a career perspective, but from a presence perspective. And what it taught me was that when uh, someone asks you to do something, you need to kind of read between the lines and understand the why behind it and what's this, really the hidden agenda on, on what, what's going on here in a situation. And I was not aware of, of the bigger picture, the macro issues from that decision that I made. And so it goes all the way back to my communication theme again of really trying to understand expectations. And if it's not clear, to be able to speak up and to, to ask why and, and, and properly set expectations for everything considered. Thank you. Amanda, you want to take us out on a, on a high note? <laughs> I think the, the one that I received and I was probably bad advice was always say yes. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, great, you'll always have an option. You'll always mm -hmm. have an opportunity. And then the next thing you know, you've said yes to everything around you <laughs> and you've got a huge problem on your hands. <laughs> so it's fine to say no. It's also fine to say not yet. And that mm -hmm. took me a really long time to learn. Good. Thank you. It has been an absolute pleasure to sit on the stage with you ladies today. Thank you so much for that. And I want to thank our audience for being so gracious. And we want to be able to pass this to you now. And we have uh, we have a few people coming around with microphones to take your questions. And if you could do us a favor, two things. One, we are live streaming, so please wait for the microphone to get to you. <laughs> and um, also give us your name when you start. So put those hands up. We would love to take your questions. Hi, um, Bess McCoy. Um, so I work in a male-dominated sector. 
Um, and one of the things I've noticed is that uh, my male counterparts don't have as much trouble as I do getting a seat at the table, getting involved in uh, meetings, conversations, whatever that they need to make the decisions they need to do, uh, do their job right. So I'm just wondering what advice you have um, on a practical standpoint. I know there's some uh, changes that need to be made um, culturally, but but as a woman in that position, what advice would you have? I would jump in and say make alliances. Mm -hmm. This is this is a big piece. It's so easy in a male dominated space when everyone you're working with is a guy, and especially because we do integrate our lives, it's easy to fall back into this tendency of people trying to be friends with everyone they work with. And so who do they end up interacting with? The people that are most similar to them. Mm -hmm. And so the men end up bringing other men into the room and they don't even think about you because they're just thinking about their friends who they happen to be working with. Mm -hmm. But if you start building alliances, and I think it's okay at this day and age to say, I'm gonna go and say, those five guys are gonna be my new friends. Doesn't need to be best friends, but they're gonna be your alliances. You're gonna actively go talk to them. And then at some point you're gonna bring up and say, hey, do you mind including me in that next meeting? I was gonna, kind of taking it out a different path. Um, I think being the only woman in a male-dominated industry is a real competitive advantage because you're different and people will remember you. That advice was given to me by a mentor in 85. 1985 changed my entire perspective and, and really laid the groundwork for a, a career. So the question is how do you have others recognize how lucky they are that you're there? <laughs> Okay, so you've got to be able to 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 um, to position yourself, uh, accept the fact that you're different. You don't want to try to pretend that you're a man because you're not. You've got to be able to come back and say, you know, I have a different perspective. Um, it might be interesting to hear, you know, uh, to to have a different perspective at the table. Somebody, you know, and it may not, and it's age too, right? I mean, it's not just gender. Right? You know, there's different. You know, how do how do you play the differentiation? Uh, card because it's that diversity that helps organizations make better decisions. So somehow position it in a way that they they want to have you at the table. Other questions? We here. Hi, uh, Maggie Bailey, uh, and I also work in a male-dominated industry. And I know in my company there's a lot of enthusiasm for women in the workplace, and I love that. But as a person of color, being the only woman in a room feels already different. Uh, but then also being the only person of color in the room is it makes it even you know stand out even more. How do we talk about you know embracing women in the workplace, lifting women up? but also adding, you know, it's great that we have 49% of women. What's also that percentage of women of color as well? How do we talk about that more? So I know everyone is looking at me at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna sure. say to you, I am happy to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> and not to say that my uh, friends up here can't, but I think that is another uh, layer that we're gonna have to uh, continue to have conversations. It's not just enough to have the gender issue on the table when we are, our, our sisters are in the space. If you are in the space and you're noticing a difference of any type, I think it's our responsibility mm -hmm. to call it out. Now, I'm gonna also say as a person of color, um, and this is for anyone, do your homework. And so when you speak, make sure whatever you're speaking about is on topic, on point, so that it's not, unfortunately, you will carry the weight of every other woman of color sometimes, if it's right or wrong. So you really, really have to do and be that voice sometimes for the person of color. But if you get in that space, and anyone who knows me will tell you I'm going to bring it up. And sometimes it's very uncomfortable because I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for the girls that sit at Girls Inc. Because I don't want in 20 years this to be the, the same picture. And I'm not saying eliminate the white males. I'm not saying eliminate the white females. I'm saying make room at the table for us all. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, it is something that we're going to have to continue to work for and work at. Um, because there is a noticeable difference in the women of color not being in spaces. So I um, thank you for that question, and I'm always happy to answer any question around 
women of color. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? You want to come over here to the center, please? All the way in the middle. I'm sorry, Gloria. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Beverly Hendel, and um, like many of you, I work in a male-dominated industry. Well, I'm an active duty captain in the United States Army. I'm here at yeah. WashU as an assistant professor at the ROTC program. Yeah. Don't mention it. Um, <laughs> so being a teacher is actually not my main profession. I'm a logistician for the United States military, and I um, just finished uh, an assignment in Germany where I think the civilian equi equivalent would be like director of you know a hundred person organization and and so I, I've only worked with men I've only worked for men uh, so it's just absolutely amazing to be here with all of you because it smells so good in here uh, and uh, so you know I feel comfortable you know working with men and, and all of that but as I've gotten you know higher you know in in my career progression something that I uh, I read something that said, you know, men get promoted based on potential, but women are only getting promoted based on their current performance. And that really spoke to me because mm -hmm. I always felt like I had to be just perfect in every single situation. Um, not only am I, you know, working crazy um, and I'm always in a leadership position, but, you know, I'm a mother. Um, I'm also, you know, I was married. And and so I was, you know, doing that emotional labor that's like so popular now that's finally being recognized in addition to just the everyday, you know, running a company, right, making decisions. Um, and I always felt like my male counterparts, they were just free to focus on their jobs. And because, you know, men are being promoted based on potential, it's so easy to view men um, in the future it's like well i can see him mm -hmm. in the future but for women it's like well what does that look like and i'm just going to judge her on like what is she doing every single day and there's just not a lot of wiggle room there's no mm -hmm. i feel like there's not as much forgiveness for women when they're currently performing as there's forgiveness given to male counterparts because it's just easier to imagine them you know, in their potential. Um, and I do acknowledge the men in the room, so if you can speak to this, if I'm being just overly sensitive and play devil's advocate, but if you're in a management role where you do give out, you know, performance evaluations, like, am I acknowledging a real um, bias? And, and if any of you have anything to speak to, it's not really a question, it's like a thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I will again, the internalized piece that we carry sometimes also uh, shows up and we have to deprogram ourselves, I believe, and starting again at the younger age because we tell our young girls, you have to be perfect. You got to look like this. You got to be that. We got to stop that. Mm -hmm. And we have to then know that we are worthy of. And so you dream, don't worry about what they're dreaming about, dream of what that could be for you and wear that and walk in there and ask for it. And you may get told no, so what? Ask for it again. And don't be afraid to continue to ask for it, but have in your mind what it is that you want. And I do believe when we can dream it, we will be it. And so when you're walking into spaces knowing that you're all of that, others will notice it too, but you've got to believe it first. I think, I think that's absolutely right. I think, you know, to what you said and what the, the young lady said up here, I think it is, um, it's easy sometimes to get frustrated if you believe that you've been treated somehow differently. Um, you never, one of the tricky things is you actually, you, usually you don't know for certain uh, whether you've been treated differently. And so it's a very difficult thing to sort of, um, and you don't actually have to judge because I think it's, it, it's difficult to get brought down by that. I think it's important to know, for example, um, just to know that you should be in the room. You should be in the room. So if you're not in the room, ask to be in the room uh, or find a way to do that. So I think I think that's important. And the other piece is there's a there's an amount of this as much as we all want to uh, change it or be part of the solution that uh, the conditions today are the conditions today. 
And so um, the good thing is the conditions today are much better than they have been uh, in the past and for, for generations before me. Um, and, and we can enjoy fantastic careers. Uh, but to, to I think it's, it's hard if you focus on it too much. I, I, I find it personally much easier to sort of focus on what I, what I can control. I think it's also important to think about the future from a personal development perspective. Um, and the words you use, uh, I'm, con- I'm interested in continuing to grow my career from a development perspective. What, what, what do you see as my next opportunity? Have that kind of dialogue with your superiors to be able to talk about development and so, so that you're ready for the next opportunity when it presents itself. We have about five minutes and I would love to, to get in a couple more questions. So um, can we come over here? Yeah. Good morning. Uh, My name is Cynthia, and I'm an alumni of the Women's Leadership Forum here at Olin. Um, We had the most accomplished um, and representative group of candidates for president in my lifetime. Um, When I go to vote on Monday in Missouri, it will be two septuagenarian white men, still accomplished. What needs to change? It's a hard one, right? Because there, are, when you get to that level, there are um, it's that's in a pretty elite level, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly, you know, one of the things that's interesting that I've seen, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the details, is that at the leadership level, the president, head of state level, um, I think I remember seeing an article a couple years back when Brazil was going through some issues with uh, Dilma Rousseff, is that her name? Um, and, and what they've said is that if you go through women heads of state, powerful women in history, they have typically not risen independently. They've been groomed by someone more than men leaders have at that level, at that head of state level, um, where someone has promoted them. And so I think it's important, first of all, for everybody to recognize that there need to be women in leadership and then to have, um, promoters within, within, you know, politics, I, I, I suppose. I mean, I think it's always difficult because you've got some unconscious bias there and, and these are publicly elected individuals. Um, but I think everyone needs to be educated against about biases and so forth. And I, I do think that, you know, the, the men um, in our society can be incredibly helpful in affecting change and having this discussion helps get us further to a, a better place there. But I don't know what's gonna happen anytime, that's gonna happen anytime soon. And I might argue also that, um, I, you know, the system is a little bit broken right now. You know, uh, everyone in, in Congress, everyone who's a candidate is an attorney and our system was never set up for that. We have no educators, we have no tradespeople. We have no, no you know, we don't have true economists or, or financiers that are very few of them um, in there. And so, you know, who are attorneys? Who, who, loves, the, who loves the verbal fight? who's willing to take the abuse, right? And so I think you know, that's also, that's a, that's a factor in there as well. And there's also a lot of research that shows simply that even when Hillary was running for president, the tone of her voice was, was something that really turned people away from her. And it was just, it's simply a measure of decibels. And so there's a very fine line in what, what people find to be both an attractive voice and a credible voice. Right? I think that's really interesting. I, I also wonder, though, if it's a little bit of a commitment for everyone in the room. So I'm, I'm on a personal mission right now for backing candidates who are female, and I'm agnostic of party, which is tough for me. That's really tough. <laughs> um, that being said, I'm going to make sure I get a woman elected to a role. And so I've been actively fundraising now for a year and a half with multiple candidates. One who I actually met and didn't know anything about her. She's from the Republican Party. I will admit I had made some assumptions didn't necessarily dive into the conversation with her, met the person she was running against who was a very traditional old white male who had made a comment to me at a luncheon and said, you know, Me Too was just a sham. The whole thing was a sham. And I remember being like, I'm gonna remember your name. And sure enough, I meet this woman and she starts telling me what she's running for. And I kind of tuned out to be honest, because I didn't think we would agree on a lot of things. But then she told me who she was running against. And it was that man. So I then threw her multiple fundraisers immediately after and wrote her a check. And so I think it's a little bit of be on a personal mission. Be on a personal mission to accept that we need to have diversity across parties, across perspectives, and be willing to commit to that and do the work and do the capital side of it as well. Because I can tell you it's been very hard 
for a lot of the women I've worked with to raise money to be able to fight those mm -hmm. people. So do the work. And so I'm going to add time. to that on the capital part, and I'm going to tie it to fundraising for nonprofits first. It's no different. So uh, there was a study out like in December that said 15% of the fundraising dollars globally go to women organizations. But there's 70 to 80% of women giving money, okay? I would, I would bet that's pretty much the same without getting into the political parties that are we supporting women in a way that's financial? Uh, are we supporting women even in just the training around if you want to be a candidate? I'm not so certain. So our dollars and our money is going to also make a whole lot of sense on what we're doing with it if we're truly about making some changes. That's my opinion. Thank you. It looks like we are out of time. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for taking time out of your morning. Please, a round of applause for our panelists and to Stacey Thomas.